That should be a performance here. I know. Let me just take it. No, but is this also an edge? We're ready? We're ready. Okay. So I'm going to do the intro. Okay. Well, welcome everyone to the next iteration of Illuminated Curiosity's public program today, titled Deconstructing Agent Orange, History as Artistic Materials, Medium, and Testimonies. Thank you all for gathering here this evening for this unique chance to listen and converse with us. I believe that Ang Din needs no introductions. His lifelong devotion to artistic development and historical exploration are clearly shown in his impressive series of works which have been exhibited all over the world, from Japan to Europe to the US. And I'm so honored to include the Damn Gene series, one of his earliest work, when Din returned to Vietnam in the late 90s. In Illuminated Curiosities, Damn Gene began as a pop-up exhibition in a kiosk with the Saigon Trade Center, which is now defunct. The work was a timely response to an episode of historical revision at that time, when the local government was pursuing an international lawsuit against companies that were responsible for spreading Agent Orange here during the war. Within a context of restricted information and scrutiny, then decided to stage Damage Gene in a public place, albeit guerrilla, guerrilla style, in order to raise his concern about the role of objects as testimonies of history and how art continues to shed light on gray areas of history. And this is also personally a very poignant moment for me, as this is the first time Din has showcased this series in Vietnam, the first time. So let that sink in a little bit. So I consider all of us here extremely lucky to be able to see it in person. If you haven't seen the exhibition yet, I urge you to go see it soon before it, uh, before it closes in December. Um, in Illuminated Curiosity is split between two MSC campuses, and I would recommend you to visit both. And I want to thank the Nguyen Foundation, Chi Quỳnh and Ng Tuyet, the founders, Bill and Yet and the Nguyen team, Ace Lei and Tham Nguyen, the other two curatorial members, and all of the artists and art workers who have made this show possible. Thank you, TZM, for your endless support in preparation for the talk tonight. And without further ado, let us welcome our artists. Thank you, Lei. Thank you for being here. Um, I know the traffic is a little mad, but uh, I'm glad that you guys came. Uh, so we're doing yeah, it all so, in English? Um, yes, we're doing it all in English. Oh, okay. I'm sorry I can't translate tonight, so it's a bit uh, too much. Okay. So, um, let's see. Um, so, well, um, thank you, Embassy, for having me here, and uh, the team at the uh, Winnard Foundation. And, and we've been, we've been Sort of in a conversation about yeah, this for talk a for a long time. time. Yeah. yeah, all the way from back from July, I think. Yeah, so two months in, sure. in the making. Yeah, so <clears throat> it's it's kind of nice to be able to talk, kind of revisit this body of work. Okay. Uh, because over the years, I keep you know like showing it, and then it travel all over the world, and then revisit the subject once in a while. And so these projects have come, always kind of been staying with me for over the, the years. Ending, uh, but uh, we'll go to you know like the beginning of the project and all the many different stages of it over the years. And since uh, it was done in 1998, which is 2000, so it's over 20 years now. And this it, film is uh, this work is older than some of us in the auditorium. Yeah, and I it was pointed out to me that I actually had hair uh, <laughs> in one of the documentation. So, so uh, in the talk okay. because you know to show proof that at least you know there was. There I was, was young hair. once. <laughs> Okay. So, yeah, can we have the film on here? Uh, 
um, this is the, what are they called, International Trade, uh, Trade Center. Center. It's on Pastor and uh, uh, Lelai. Lelai. Lelai and Pastor. Um, at the time, it was uh, a kind of a shopping center where a lot of people have a little shop kiosk inside and selling clothing uh, stuff. Uh, there is, uh, um, I think, uh, a, 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 a restaurant in a, a kind of, uh, not restaurant, but a kind of uh, eating center in the middle of it. And, and so there was a lot of people selling little knickknacks and shop and everything. So this is where, um, so this is where the, the place happened. Unfortunately, uh, there was a big fire about 10, 10, 10 years 10 ago. Years ago. A lot of people died, so now it's closed and they have uh, rebuilt it as, uh, I think it's called the Liberty Hotel now. So, but uh, back then it was, it was like this, the surrounding. So, um, so this is a little chaos. Uh, I have came back to Vietnam uh, 93, my first time. And 93 to 97, 98, I keep going back and forth, three months here, three months in uh, the States. And then it gets longer and longer. But anyway, so during my, my initial visit of, of Vietnam, uh, back then in the early 90s, you, you, you have to understand there was literally nothing in terms of the arts or, or um, uh, in, in Saigon anyway, in Hanoi, a little bit different. Um, and at that time, there were a lot of people were begging on the street and many have all kind of deformities that I didn't quite know uh, why so many. And at that time, in the early 90s, there was no help for these people. Um, and so they were basically trying to, you know, begging to survive. And so uh, I start to kind of dig into the story, you know, talk to them and find out. And send then, of course, the, 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 the story become more apparent that these people were suffering uh, Agent or uh, you know, the, the damage by Agent Orange. And so that was the, the, the kind of initial. And then what I was really interested in was a kind of silence, a, a, a kind of silence in the community, in the governments about the whole subject matter. So you have, you know, uh, the American government, and even today they refuse to accept uh, responsibility for it. Uh, back then, they refused to even discuss the subject matter because as soon as you discuss, accept to discuss the subject matter, uh, Agent Orange, uh, soil contaminations, and uh, birth defects in Vietnam, um, that mean you acknowledge there's a problem. So the, the U.S. government refused to discuss it publicly. And this is, you know, the information I got from so many people that I've, I've spoke to. And then the Vietnamese government, on the other hand, want to talk about it, but at the same time, they trying to figure out how to talk about it. This is even before the lawsuit to, to the chemical companies that produce Agent Orange and birth defects, uh, uh, that produce Agent Orange, um, because Vietnam had become the second largest rice exporter in the world. And coffee, our agricultural export in the 90s was the first thing that, uh, you know, that was kind of pushed forward the export sector and bring in a lot of revenues for Vietnam. So for the Vietnamese government to discuss soil contamination and, you know, a, uh, the, uh, uh, the Agent Orange in the ground, they feared would affect the agriculture export. So there was also 
a kind of reluctant to publicly discuss this matter. And then on the other hand, the people, you know, you see people walk, you know, begging on the street. And And nobody talk about any about it because it's a taboo subject. People fear of talking about it, and you know, uh, they would if they talk about it, they think about it, they might give birth to one. And so it was this really strange collective silence. Everybody was just like, we we don't want to think about it. We don't want to talk about it. And so I started doing a lot of research on it. And then, you know, uh, I think that that was the, and then the question was, this is in the 90s. If I do it in a gallery, well, first of all, there's no galleries in the, that's not the kind of gallery in Saigon that would allow this kind of exhibition happen. And then if, there is a gallery, the, the, the possibility of getting the permission from the Ministry of Culture to showcase this work is, is also not possible because they still haven't figured out how to talk about Asian origin birth defect and to have the Ministry of Culture, you know, kind of approve this kind of project. It's impossible. So all this so you know i was looking around but at that time the government was encouraged people to open up shops open up business selling to bring in you know like businesses and revenues and and so i thought that that is kind of the way to get around the system to get around all of this but also to put it publicly in the center of the public rather than in a white cube gallery where you know a limited number would go but not the general public and i wanted to be to be able to access to the general public not the art going audience and so that was all of that was kind of in play and that's how this project begins um so i i, I have friend in this um this this shop uh, this this uh, shopping center who have their own shop and so i start to have conversation with some of the people in there and one lady she's uh, have a children clothing shop and uh, she was willing to uh take a vacation <laughs> and move all her stuff out <laughs> and i double you know i whatever rent she paid to, to the building, I double it so she can have a vacation. And, uh, you know, she moved her stuff out and I moved her my stuff in. But the, the whole project was so kind of interesting at that time because, um, first of all, the production of, of the objects was just kind of crazy. Uh, for example, the, uh, so maybe, Oh, uh, let, let, let me fast forward this. Okay. Uh, oh. yeah, let's, so, uh, oh, 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 let me start. In the end. Out. The, the project was really interesting is that, so, you know, it's out in the open. <laughs> and uh, the, the Ministry of Culture, which is in charge of exhibition, and they, it's not that problem. So they never show up. It's, it's just like, they don't care. Uh, so the people in charge of commerce and, uh, and, and this building, they come by. And so they're like, what the hell is going on? And so I explained it. I, I was just, um, uh, you know, trying to make money. 
um, as a way, you know, talking about uh, just, you know, making clothing for Saigon twins because in Vietnam, there's so many of them being born uh, because of the, uh, the uh, and <laughs> the, they're not quite understanding it, but they sort of kind of don't want to make a big deal out of it. So they, they allow me to open it for like a whole month. Um, what's really interesting is like half the, the people that went through that area, they ignore it. They just do not want to see it. They put a blinder on and they walk through. But the other half, they stop by and they look. And about a quarter of them actually stop talking, asking questions. And that was really interesting. That's when the conversation began. And so many, I've learned so many interesting things about Agent Orange and birth effects from these people. Uh, everybody know about it, but nobody want to talk about it. That was kind of really kind of interesting. Uh, somehow I think the, uh, uh, we allow a kind of a, a place for them to talk. Uh, and so uh, eventually it, it will lead to other work, but, uh, one of the most interesting, you know, I, it was just a shop. It would just open up and the, the people that there's an organization that in charge of uh, information about Asian origin birth defects, they came out and uh, they invite me back to their place. And it was really interesting. It's like they were yelling at me for putting out information uh, that haven't been approved by them yet. But at the same time, they were showing me so much information. They keep pulling out information. And I, I think I was, at some point, I realized that they actually want me to see all of this. But they just go, you know, it's their job to yell at me because they, they haven't been approved. But they, I think they want the world to see. But the, the problem was, like, the policy at that point was, they have to be very careful. They cannot put out information, but they want the one. So that was really kind of interesting how the reactions through everything. And, you know, it was, it was just a shop. It was open for a month. And now on the screen here, you see um, the man over here. Uh, I was talking to and his wife. They are actually the head of Age and origin birth defect researcher at the university uh, in Saigon. They heard about the project through word of mouth and they came out. And that was really kind of amazing. And they actually sat on the, he actually sat on the National Assembly uh, as, as the, I don't know where he is now, where did he retire or not? But uh, so through word of mouth, a lot of people came through. We have the head researcher from um, uh, the Japanese. There's a whole Japanese group that doing research on dioxin in Vietnam, and they came out. And so it was really kind of interesting, uh, a whole different kind of way of uh, doing an, uh, a project. It was more like a, a community uh, happening event rather than a, a a regular exhibition. Yeah, and like I had hair back then too, so <laughs> did you see? <laughs> oh um, yes, this is Ang Ding in fully <laughs> curly locks, as you can see. So uh, anyway, so uh, I just want to share a little bit of information about how this file comes to us. So TZM, who's sitting in the audience, Ang Ding's assistant, has managed to hold on to the VHS the VHS, like the actual VHS of this film for I don't know how many years, like so many times of moving houses, she managed to hold on to it. And we managed to convert it into a digital file just about a day ago. So you're looking at histories in object as well as in narrative as well. So just a bit of background information on the film itself. This is uh, some of the statistics that I, I did research during that time. Um, and there was uh, 
good article at Wall Street uh, Journal in 1997, uh, as well as as well as congressional report uh, later on that was I had regulations on. Um, but as you see, unbelievable the amount of damage Agent Orange did uh, in Vietnam, and even today, um, the U.S. Government have given some funding to clean up sites in uh, in Da Nang as well as in Binh Hoa now. But uh, instead of you know publicly acknowledge uh, the problem, still the U.S. government still refused to do it. Um, so most of the help now, thank God, the, the help now for the people, the children. And many of them are adult now that are suffering with the deformities. Um, there are international help funding to kind of have good clinics and things like that are helping them now. Uh, and so that's why you don't see them on the street anymore. But way back when, then there was no help. So they come to the city in order to seek help for, 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 for you know, to, to kind of survive. So, um, the the shop you know we have all this kind of stuff uh, uh, it was kind of chaotic because the, the the area was uh, partly for international tourists partly for local shopper the, like children clothing and uh, knockoff DVDs and little knickknacks for the for people to bring home so I start to kind of commission you know, artists and, and, and people to, to make all this object as a way to kind of, not only they encounter the, the project and the, the issues, but I want them to bring it home. I want them to bring it home and think about it. Because I think it's so easy for us to um, a kind of, encounter it and dismiss it because we don't want to bring this kind of thing so but how do you ask people to bring subject like this home uh, in a way that that you know doesn't kind of uh, uh, make them make them want to uh, kind of bring willing to bring it home and so that this was a way of kind of making all this object to uh, aesthetically, in a way to kind of make it so that way that, that they're not so revolt by the subject matter. Uh, I have seen so many horrific way of display, and many of you, I, I'm pretty sure, have been to the War Remnant Museum, and you see the, the way it's been portrait. While it's extremely effective, but I think as soon as we walk out there, we don't want to think about it anymore because it's so horrific. And so I was finding, I was hoping to find a different way, uh, you know, that for us to stay with the subject and not move on with our lives and with other issues and, you know, things like that. But I want it to be in people's home. So that was the, the, the kind of the impulse to create this very lovable kind of objects. Uh, these are the ladies that have shops surrounding my shop. <laughs> At first, they they not quite sure what to do with me and the project because they're like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> Uh, but I think, you know, as the conversation started and, 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 and it keep going, they start to become my uh, supporter. I mean, it was like really amazing. They, uh, they understood and they start to help me out. I couldn't be there from, you know, like 10 o'clock to six o'clock every day. So they took over whenever I'm not there, they took over the shop when People come through, they explain. And this uh, is the, the age where we don't have promotional growth of voice yet. So. 
<laughs> so that was really kind of uh, amazing to, to have these ladies. And I, I still keep in touch with some of these ladies. Oh. Yeah. I mean, uh, so so that was. So we, we have t shirts that are both in Vietnamese and in English that have statistics about Agent Orange uh, and birth defects. Uh, and they were all, everything in the shop was for a dollar. And at that time, it was $10,000. Um, and I couldn't sell anything except the international tourists. The local refused to buy anything. And so we, we give away the t-shirts actually, and people actually take the t-shirts. Um, um, and so, you know, we have clothing made, we have, uh, uh, Uniform. Uniform. We have, uh, yeah, so we have name of a uh, chemical company that produces Asian Orange, uh, embroidered uh, on the, as a logo, like now logo here. And we have uh, sweaters. And uh, one of the most fascinating things is like the young women that, you know, the seamstress refused to do any of this work. And of course, it's a taboo subject. They don't want to touch it. And they don't want to fear that they might give birth to one if they you know, deal with it. Okay. So we end up finding a lot of women with uh, past childbearing age uh, to, to work on this project. So it was really kind of interesting how culturally, you know, like, and all these uh, wow. issues that you just didn't. So expected. it went from like a social justice and historical issues into a cultural one because of the stigma and the superstition. Yeah, of because you know, it was a way of kind of engaging that and how do you bypass all these barriers mm -hmm. that people kind of cultural and stick and, and taboos and, and how do you bypass it in order mm -hmm. to get people to start talking. And so that, that was really kind of, uh, kind of, uh, a really kind of fascinating. Uh, we were able to open the shop for one month and no censorship, nobody from the Ministry of Culture show up. Um, and that was really kind of amazing. <laughs> but then, you know, you know, early in the 90s, uh, the, uh, the, the law is not so strict. So I think in the early 90s, uh, nothing is defined yet. So in, in, in many ways, it allowed you a lot of freedom to kind of navigate in, in places like Vietnam. Uh, and, you know, uh, and so that was a really kind of a wonderful period of time, even though uh, at that time, you know, like, uh, for example, the internet was illegal. There was no internet in Vietnam in the 90s. You have to go to somebody's house, somebody told you that there's a house there, you go, you type on their computer uh, the message and the, uh, in the email message, you know, and then uh, when they have enough email, they call a modem in Thailand and they hook up to that modem in Thailand and they send out all the messages and then a couple of days later, they call the same modem and they download whatever, email come back and then they let you know and then you come back to that place and you check the, if you got an email so, so that, for the younger <laughs> audience in the room this sounds like you know fantasy land <laughs> it was really um i love it i i i, I think i think nora it. in the room you can attest to that because you were in hanoi at that time so you you went through the same thing <laughs> it was uh i think you know nora no it was like the 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 frustration but the possibilities which is, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so there was, uh, I think it was really kind of, uh, this time it's like, um, I don't know, I mean, it was hard, but I always felt like, oh God, there's so many possibilities here. And so that, that was uh, an amazing kind of, uh, anyway. So uh, the project become a kind of documentation and it's been traveling around the world over the years. Uh, this was showing in Australia. 
um, and it become a little bit more fancy, Gucci, like. Um, is this in Queensland? The yeah. Asia, Asia China, Asia. Asia Pacific. Yeah. Pacific. And uh, we have the video. Yeah. And um, so, should we? Yeah, we can introduce quickly. Uh, do you want to have questions and um, things like that? And we can start. Yeah. Keep going. Um, I think I think we we can just share a little bit about Lotus Line and Pure Land. Okay. Go on to the, the discussion. Um, so you know, through the conversations of this project and the many people I met uh, during the. The, the, the one month there, um, I heard of this kind of amazing story. Um, and, and not just one, but like a few, that people are praying to the children that were born with deformities. And except one pair, which is Viet and Duk, I think, Mm. The, that survived, that was separated by the Japanese. Uh, uh, you mean the Siamese twins? The Siamese twins. All of them never made it. You know, they basically stillborn or they survive only a couple of days and they die. And so the people in Vietnam, I think many of you know how superstitious and we pray to everything as long as bring us luck, fortunes. Uh, I, I was just having a conversation the other day. It's like, it doesn't matter what kind of gods in Vietnam enter Vietnam, as long as you bring me fortune and good luck, I'll, I'll, I'll worship you. So very that, flexible spiritually. That, that, that's <laughs> Vietnam. Anyway, so they were telling me that, you know, people start praying to this church for luck. For is, winning is the lottery in the south, oh, in the south and they go to like the the, the graves of, of this children. Oh, wow. So you go from you know something that fear somebody doesn't want to talk about it when they are alive, when they're real, when they die, they become something else. Now because now they die, they're gone. They become an abstraction. They become an idea and not physically real anymore. And so people now deal with them differently. People kind of accept them as a kind of pure being because they're, they're, they're innocent children. Uh, um, and, and, and also they kind of fall into a kind of pantheon of, of God and goddesses in the kind of uh, Buddhism and Hindu uh, 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 you know, of, of multiple arms and multiple heads. So, in a way, you know, these children become a kind of deities. So, these people are kind of go to their graves and they pray to them for luck and, and, and fortune. And so, I, I was kind of fascinating how they go from something so fear into something, you know, that, that that people would kind of worship and, 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 and how we transform them. And so uh, I start working with the, um, the, 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 the people who make, the artisan who make uh, statue for, for, for temples. And so that's, this is where this project, how it came about, is, is based on that story, how we translate this horrific kind of subject matter and how we uh, how the community kind of uh, come to term with it maybe uh, how we kind of translate and how we come to term how we deal with it in a way and so this was uh, done uh, I 2000. think about two yeah uh, a couple of years later um, and uh, yeah so, so this guy will work on temple uh, statues. Uh, and so we, we just, um, I worked with him and we designed this uh, as a way and we had this kind of wonderful conversation about uh, the uh, Buddhist agonati and, and how we incorporate, you know, the, 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 the deformities into the obvious prior text. So, uh, so this, this, this uh, came about and now uh, it's in 
the museum collection in Queensland now. We have some of these pieces actually in the exhibition along with them. Uh, so the small one. The smaller one. Yeah, yeah the small the one. one. Yeah. So, so, uh, so that uh, kind of started uh, the project. And then, you know, like uh, I revisit projects once in a while. I rethink about them in the, because of the time of change. And as the, the time change, society have changed. The community change. Uh, Vietnam, you know, like going from the night, uh, the early nineties to today, it's a completely new city. Uh, uh, completely different generations, completely different kind of uh, th way of thinking. Uh, many of these people, as as you said, many of, of the younger one weren't even born when this project was was done. And you know, one of the things that I, I find most interesting uh, is that the gaming industry is really big here. Um, and many of some of the best designers of the gaming industry are here in Vietnam. And again, you know, kind of thinking about that and thinking about all the um, what do you call avatar, the, all the figures that in the game. Again, they, you know, they have multiple arms, multiple heads, and, and I've seen some wonderful design. And I'm like, oh, this is really interesting. This is, again, it's a, it's a way for me to kind of reintroduce the subject matter in a new kind of way of thinking to a whole new generation. And so this is uh, in 2018. And so I worked with uh, with a game, uh, uh, this guy who's like a really young guy, he's like 20 something, uh, who designed figures uh, in, in, for the game. You know, like, so you have, uh, and so we sit down and we start a conversation and, you know, so, and, and then he designed, um, together we designed this, this, this uh, three dimensional, uh, figured on it's on the computer. Everything was done uh, 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 on the computer, and um, and we sent it to. It was uh, produced. It was uh, what is it? Uh, uh, printing. Uh, what do you? Three D printing. Three D printing. It was three. It was sent to China for three D printing, and uh, it was done in China. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's just like I think you know once in a while I revisit a project and I try to think about you know what's now, what's the language we use now, uh, who am I talking to now, and so that that was really kind of interesting way of kind of moving uh, a subject that we're still grappling with H and Orange and Birth Effect we're still grappling it. There's no end to it. There's no end to it because it affects us on a genetic level. Just a pin drop ahead of it. If it enters your system, it changes your genetic makeup. And it, you pass it down to your children. And your children pass it down to your grandchildren. And they research have done, they have follow some of the uh, uh, veterans, the, the veterans in America and in Australia who were exposed to Agent Orange during the Vietnam War. And they have able to track down that their grandchildren, and I, I don't know about the great grandchildren, but have carried the genetic kind of damage uh, that, that can be passing down from one generation to another. So uh, it's not ending, it's still ongoing. And how do we, you know, keep uh, the subject talking about it in a new way to a new generation? So that that was uh, that was the way of, you know, I was thinking about this, and uh, and so this is how. And uh, this is going to be continued in continuation still. Right? If I'm still around, <laughs> <laughs> so. I'm sure you'll be for many many more years. <laughs> Yeah, so um, just want to share a little bit from my curatorial perspective before we go into uh, discussion, and then we'll open up to Q&A for everyone in the auditorium. 
if you go down to see the display downstairs, you see that the clothes and the dolls are all displayed a little bit differently compared to either the kiosk or in Queensland or in other museum settings, the gallery setting. So I was the one who had to iron all of your <laughs> the clothes that you made and pick up the dolls and clean them and put them into the glass boxes. So I just want to share a little bit about how, you know, dealing with artistic objects. It's when you talk about the, the, the inheritance, you know, the genetic inheritance that is carried on by people with Asian origin, the sense of emotions and memories that are imbued in the objects, you feel it when you act, when I actually have to iron them, I actually have to put them on the wall. And I was by myself, it was 7 p.m. here, like there was no one. <laughs> So I was by myself, like ironing all of these clothes, and I, it was a teary moment. It was like I imagined all of the mothers who had to do this for their children with these clothes. And I just thought to myself, well, you know, this is one way that art can help you reach these topics, can help you talk about them, help you feel them, and not makes you like, you know, gross out. You know, like, because it can be quite grotesque, especially the way that people with Asian orange has been portrayed in social media, the way they've been, dare I say, dehumanized on social media. I think that this series really gives a human touch to it, to remind us all that yes, these are human. They are human with stories and emotions and misfortune of being in this position, but we don't have to be, you know, you don't have to dehumanize them any further. So I think that was one of the most beautiful parts that I received. And I hope that the audience also see that when you see the display as well. But um, to go back to the, to the talk, I do want to ask you a few questions and then we're gonna open up to the auditorium. I do know that time is a, a matter here. So I do want to go back to display because you know the series as well, Devagene and then, then Pure Land and then um, and Lotus Land have been displayed in a variety of settings. So it started at a kiosk, right? And it's like a gorilla style, people kind of drop in, drop out. It's not really a display. It's, it's public, but it's not at the same time. And then it moves on to more art specific places. So do you think, how do you think these um, different settings kind of affects the historical narratives of the world? I think the beginning, uh, of the project when it was in the shop, that was when uh, it was, uh, of course, it's completely different. It's a performance, uh, it's an action. Um, and later on, when it becomes remnants of an event, then it's a, just a documentation when it goes through uh, showing in different places, it's just a documentation of an event. And so all these objects now, I, I, I see them as uh, a documentation. It's, it's, uh, the, the, the performance was when this happened in the marketplace. Yeah. OK, so, so all of these subsequent are, to, to, to you, they're a documentation of a performance that you did. Yes. So, okay. And I rarely do performance. <laughs> so. But for, for Pure Land and, and uh, Lotus Land, so they, do you consider do them different works, separate yeah, works? Yeah, they're, they're more kind of installation sculpture. Uh, they have took uh, a, a, just a kind of different way of uh, talking to the, the, the subject matter. Um, but also, I think the society have changed. Uh, Vietnam have changed. So I, I think if I do this project, we re reenact the project again in the market, I don't think it would have the same effect. Uh, uh, the subject now is widely discussed in the newspaper. Uh, the government have policy now to kind of, and actually encourage the people to discuss about Agent Orange uh, and birth effects in Vietnam now. So, there's no need to kind of, to create a platform where people are able to kind of talk about it anymore. You know, because the platform is built and is there, it's in the public, the newspaper are discussing about it all the time now. 
um, so it's, it's very different. So again, so that's why I think uh, the sculpture, uh, the, the installation become differently because of just the environment had changed. And I think that's a beautiful part about damage scene because it has this timeliness to it, right? So there was the, it was a, in a setting in a historical time when society was different. The perception of Agent Orange was very different and there was a need um, I think collectively to silent it, but also to talk about it as well. Because obviously people do stop at your shop and, and they do start conversations about these things. So of course, I think um, like histories also change along with us as society changes. So I think that's, as we see, so hopefully in the next series, there will be a next series, we'll be waiting. There will be, it will show a different kind of context, a different kind of how people now adopted, adapted, developed this narrative. I think those are quite exciting. Yeah. Maybe different form. Yeah. Um, yeah, NFT. <laughs> <laughs> That's the talk of town. So, you know, when I look into that, these will make very good NFTs, by the way. <laughs> and actually have the digital version of it. <laughs> Imagine owning a small piece of lotus land on your phone. <laughs> All right, so that's the, the historical and the settings and how display shows histories as well. So, so I wanted you were you were talking about you know like like the superstitions and then the belief and the stories that that people had and then they come to the shop differently. So in Vietnam, we love storytelling. That's like well, I think like the the best way to get to know people here is to just sit down and have a gossip sessions with them. You'll become best friend after that. So like fairy tales, myths, history, sometimes all jumble up together. And in fact, there's a tendency in our, or in our society to mythologize history. You know, like the whole narrative of the 4,000 year and how we came from the joint marriage of a dragon and a fairy. This is, so this is kind of somewhat different to how history is taught and seen in the US, which kind of emphasize facts, you know, testimonies, reality, presumably speaking, um, depends on who's telling the story, of course. So what do you think about this supposed contrast? So in the context of your practice, in this theory particularly, and your practice as well. So, and can we separate this historical faction, uh, fiction from facts? Or are they like two sides of the same coin for you? I think it depends on, you know, the context you want to tell the story. Um, with the community at large, of course, the, you know, is the story, is the narrative, is the, the myth that create, that get people attention and people remember it. And how they kind of interpret and come to term with it is really kind of different than something so factual as, as a historical uh, documentation. And, 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 you know, we see it, you know, like even if you go to the War Remnant Museum, for example, uh, which, by the way, about not, uh, I think many people in Vietnam still refuse to go. Um, to this day? Yeah. Uh, I think mostly it's catered toward international tourists, mm -hmm. something like 90% or more than 90%. Wow. that attend the War Remnant Museum on international tours, not Vietnamese, or at least not Southern Vietnamese. <laughs> so um, I think uh, we don't trust fact and business because we have lived in a system where, well, maybe not fact, but we don't trust uh, history. Trust it. And history. so I think we, the, the people in general trust more the kind of myth, the kind of story, uh, then we, you know, then, then the, the, the factual, supposedly factual, historical uh, documentation that presented to us all every day. Yeah, so I mean, it's, we, when we try to, like, sometimes when we try to explain things, we use myths and stories, we don't really, cite data or cite articles or 
So good luck to, you know, to university students. <laughs> I've seen many people citing Wikipedia as their main process, so please, please refrain from doing that. <laughs> But, but it's different from getting, you know, historical data from your parents or your grandparents, because there's a kind of, you know, lived experience through it. So I think those are valid. But yeah, but um, so I think we're kind of running out of time, so we'll move on to the Q&A pretty quickly. But I do want to ask you one last question, because this talk is about the relationship between art and history. And for your practice particularly, because you know, we've been in conversation for a long time, you and I have known each other for quite a while. So history has often served as material in your work. So can you guide us a bit more through how you process historical data into visual inspiration? So like the transformation between what you get and how you kind of translate that into visual images and inspirations and, you know, like what role does historical research play in your artistic practice? Um. I, I I read a lot. I, I do a lot of research, but what's really I mean the, the way I process innovation is that it's really maybe different. I don't know. Maybe you guys said the same. But when I read, uh, I get vision. I don't get. I I understand intellectually the, the, the data, but I get vision. I I imagine. I see things, and that's what's why how the way I work. It's just like uh, I do research about the Vietnam War. I do research about other issues, but uh, intellectually, I understand the data. But there's something about all this rich information, and then there's always that little something that you read in there that you just like. I pick it up and my imagination run with it. And I, I, I don't know, it just, maybe it's just me, but it's really kind of, that's how I be, I able to visualize all this kind of data and, and, and bring it into, uh, uh, into form. my work, yeah. So fictionalizing histories and factualizing art. So you should put that as a model for this talk. Right. Um, so, well, thank you so much for the sharing and the conversations. I think there's a lot to learn. And now we're going to open up to Q&A. Um, we have a question already uh, from one person in the audience. Do you want to read that or should I read it? Okay. Okay. All right. So one question is from... So thank, thank you, Din, for your wonderful sharing. It has been fascinating to hear about the origin of such an important project. I would like to ask about the mode of display you chose for them in Jean. For this work, you basically took your impression of the people you had encountered on the street, those affected by Asian Orange, chose to alter children's clothing items and toys to express your point of view and display them as products to be consumed in one of the busiest markets at that time. This is a historical moment and a turning point in our own local art history, as it must have been one of the first moments of installation art and also installation art that has an interactive element that is also displayed in the public realm. How did the art community respond to your work at the time? So maybe we'll start with that first. Uh, they actually didn't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, Wait, no, I, no artists show up to your no, public? No, no, no. <laughs> it was like, it was, because my audience said that it wasn't about it wasn't about the art. It wasn't uh, in a gallery. They so you didn't know, know anything know. about it. I think over the year they heard about it, but nobody knew about it. It wasn't, I was, but also, you know, at that time in the early 90s and the late 90s when this project happened, um, there was no, really no art scene in Saigon. And whatever art scene there is, is the very traditional art scene, which is painting, cater towards the, um, tourists, and that was just not uh, what I was interested in. Uh, those artists was not somebody that I was interested in. So I was just pretty much, um, actually not many people that know that I was living in Vietnam uh, at the time also. 
uh, because I think I, I was just kind of focused on trying to do what I wanted to do. I didn't feel like, you know, you know now it's different with San Art. Uh, people start aware of what, who I am and what I do. Uh, but before that, before San Art, nobody knew I was in Saigon. So, um, what did they ask about it after the fact? Like, yeah, I think over the years, there's like uh, maybe because the, the, I get talked somewhere else and and words come um, back, word came back, and people start mention about the project, mm -hmm. and so it's it's kind of wonderful to be able to show it here in, in uh, even though it's as a documentation, um, but yeah, it was uh, this is. The first time it's been shown yeah. uh, again in, in, in Vietnam. Yeah. So about so it was in 1998. So now it's 2022. So more than 10 years after the original, <laughs> we get the documentation. So we're very grateful still. It's very honored to have to have that piece here with us physically. So anyone is, is there any questions from the audience? Everyone's too blown away, <laughs> too hungry. <laughs> well, I, I have a, I have some other questions. If um, okay. Yeah. okay. Um, I think in, in you know the Lotus Land, that kind of folksy uh, aesthetics, you know, and this is an early nineties, uh, late to uh, early two thousand. So Vietnam was pretty much still haven't changed. You know what what you see as uh, Saigon as an international city now. Back then, it was still. Basically, a hit town, <laughs> you know. So, uh, so it's it's very different, and the people attitude and the connections to uh, a kind of religious iconography is very different. And so that's why that aesthetic I was chosen. And then you know now the the pure land it's we're moving on to the twenty first century now. And we're looking at Vietnam as a cosmopolitan city, international cosmopolitan, you know, international city where, uh, as I mentioned before, um, a gaming industry is huge now. They, they designed a programming game and they brought in billions and billions um, annually. And so there's a whole different kind of aesthetic way of thinking. That, that's, and so that's why there was a whole different generation. So it's actually, it's a way to be, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, in a way, it's because the, the, the topic uh, is still ongoing. You know, the birth effect is still ongoing. There's no, it's not going to end. Uh, so how do you talk about it to the new generation? How do you find a language that they can connect to? Uh, and so that, that was, you know, a way. Oh, oh, I. Will your work showing all around the world in Queensland, Australia, Vietnam, in Thailand, Denver? Um, so, what effect, positive or negative, has it had on the community in general? Of 
I think that, well, I, I don't know directly if my project, but I hope it is. Uh, there's more support for them now. Uh, uh, and I think maybe not directly, but indirectly, the subject is still in the air. And that whether through the exhibition or, you know, that people encounter. Um, I know now the clinics, the uh, medical help for these people, there are financial support to help them survive. Uh, compared to the early 90s, that there was nothing. There was zero. They had to beg on the street. So, uh, and that's why we don't see them on the street begging anymore. We see them now, many of them are able to, uh, able to stay at home and there's some financial support or there are, are um, uh, clinics where they can stay. Uh, how good the service is, that is another issue. But at least there are some help. Thank you so much. I mean, it's so, that's a beautiful piece as well for something that's such a long problem. The subject matter as well. So I think you've done a beautiful job of being able to make it beautiful at the same time to the end of such a cross. Just building that question before, too, what has the response been from the community internationally to Australia, for example, if you can describe it? What was the response to the exhibition from people that you have experienced with themselves? Um, you know, I, 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 the exhibition was put up, particularly in Australia and Queensland, was put up and then I basically left, so uh, I didn't get, but from some of the feedback from the curators is that uh, uh, the, the people actually discuss about it and actually want to acquire the project, but I didn't want to let it go, so, uh, because it's connected to Australian history as well. And so that's, uh, so apparently it was conversa a conversation that started. Uh, I don't, I never follow exactly how far it went, um, but uh, it was important enough that the uh, Queensland Museum want to acquire the work, but uh, it was, it was, the project was just too important for me to let it go. So. I don't think we can have it here. <laughs> So, uh, the original work at the beginning was displayed in, um, in a close part of the right? uh, training center. Yeah. Have you ever talked about bringing back uh, your works or your updated works in a similar setting? So, display your works in a, in a kind of close market, in the center of Saigon. No, I, I, I've thought about it. Um, I think uh, it, 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 it would change, it would become a spectacle. And that was something that I didn't want. Uh, and I've seen spectacle happen. And uh, the subject was, the, uh, I've seen artists, Vietnamese artists are dealing with HRR and, and the way that the play was a spectacle, and I just didn't, I didn't want it to be like that. And so I think that's why I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't, um, I think in a gallery context it will be different, but to be put back in the market and to, it's just, I, I just, I, I just make me queasy because I know it's going to be a spectacle, and this is not what I'm after. Yes, Jacqueline. The questions are firing, right? Thank you, Linda, for sharing your work. It was very um, enlightening to be able to see your earlier works and your kind of nature and local history or our global history at once. I guess the question I'm trying to formulate because it's not quite clear, but I'm, I'm haunted by this quote by Harry Saluki, 
who said that he will remember the Vietnam War to Hollywood films and he will remember Iraqi War to video games. And more recently, Harvard has said that, but more or less, the war in Ukraine will be remembered from TikTok and social media. And so, thinking of the war as this patriarchal spectacle and endeavor with the screen and to be consumed in a certain visual culture of the middle economy. But how these figures that are chimeras that are part of social reproduction, maternal labor, labor of the home and house, how to kind of visual language of it. But there's a certain kind of an ease with something that is obvious, but doesn't take place in the forefront of the screen. So as I said, this is not a formal limit question, but it's something that is nagging me in terms of why do you remember the war? This these male performance so clearly, but then the other aspects of the world that aren't able to take the same space or the, the same recognition somehow. So I think you tease some of these aspects, but I, I guess I just want to push a little bit more with this kind of um, gender division in how we see the war and the effects of the war. Um, no, I think that's wonderful. Uh, because, you know, most of the, the, the writing and rewriting of the Vietnam War and history in general have been done by men. And we don't see the little thing, we don't see the domestic aspect of, um, as important. And I think that's, that's the thing, it's like, um, so why do I feel in the war? I don't know, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, when, when I was studying America, I always felt like, why am I doing oil painting? You know, I'm like, this, this, this medium that had no connection to me. It's like, there's like a long history of in Europe and we just borrow it for, you know, like, and you know, but what I'm connecting to other craft, I grew up with it. You know, I grew up with the embroidery. I remember the first shirt that that were given to me with a little embroidery of, of uh, uh, Charlie, you know, the Sacklo, Sha uh, Charlie Chaplin, Charlie Chaplin. You know, like I was just like, wow, this is like so amazing. I thought you were talking about the murdering doll. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I grew up with grass. We all grew up with well in Vietnam, and so that language connected to me much much more than let's say, you know, like oil paint or, or, or video or, uh, I mean, the, the reason why I, I use a lot of photography, but even in photography, I took it apart and I use craft aspect. I cut it up and I weave it together. Uh, it's a way for me to, to, to make the connection with this medium that I needed to me. And so craft has always important in my practice uh, is, is a way of connection, of connecting to uh, who I am. And I think when I was in America, it was like, I was like, I'm always asking like, why am I studying Western history? Why am I studying Western art history? How does it connect to me? And you know what little class that I could find that, that, that taught about Asian art or, or Asian art history, uh, there was not much. You know, this is like in the, the, I went to uh, college uh, in America in 80, 84. And so, you know, Asian study was just coming into me. Ethnic study was just the beginning. So basically my education was primarily for a white, Kid. And so I think that was really the, the needs for me to connect somehow to who I am was really important. And so that's why craft and, and other little domestic work uh, always kind of come back into my practice.
and to introduce it to the audience. It's the Vietnamese title is Chiến tranh không có một phương pháp mới. So if you want to look up on that, there is um, it's a very beautiful book written about you know the role of women in the representation of women or the lack thereof in the war as well. So just a bit of a footnote. Um, so as you are yours, yeah, I think now they're and in a way they're a little bit less restricted and more inspirational. I'm wondering how your hard works um play off of um the realism and the social issues. And I was wondering from an artist's viewpoint, do you expect um or do you direct do you hope to direct a certain social a, a certain discussion or social reaction um, with your art works? Uh -huh. I think, you know, as time changes, also it depends on um, this, this, uh, the, the shop was here, a different kind of audience, um, a different time. And as over the years, my career, you know, like moving in a different direction, I show primarily, mostly international, not here. And so that's a whole different different kind of audience uh, a whole that I that um, so the 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 need for a kind of uh, to be so uh, narrative based is no it's, it's less now I think that's some aspect I, I don't know if I, if I make work here again it's probably not, it's going to be because the Vietnam also have changed and the whole new audience that uh, are capable of looking at an artwork now that, you know, compared to the early 90s uh, or the, the late 90s when I was doing this. So uh, time changes, place changes, and I think it's, it just depends on, you know, like, and maybe I don't know. I mean, I, I've been doing it for so long that uh, more than 20 years now being an artist. Um, that also maybe I'm also changing. Uh, I, I, maybe I take it for granted everybody should be able to understand what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah. So, is so what also the audience? Okay, that's all right. So I think we can. I think it's it's about time we wrap up as well. So once again, I just want to thank uh, Ingen so much for not only being here, sharing and talking with us, but also including Damage Gene in Illuminated Curiosities, and to see an actual bit of history in our exhibition. I think it's my honor as a curator, and everyone's here as pleasure as audience. And thank you all for coming here. Thank you. Um, big thanks to the team from Winat Foundation who has been helping us uh, with logis logistics support, friends, new friends who have come and joined our conversation and asked very wonderful questions. Um, so it's always